Now, friends, as we come back to this passage, you may recall that we have come this evening to a relatively new section. We're still in that part where he's dealing with the preparation of the gospel of peace, but we come to a new point in it. And it begins with a question. Why is it called the preparation of the gospel of peace? Why is this name, this title used? Well, Garner tells us that it is called this because the gospel is God's great instrument by which he works into the will of man a preparation for suffering. It's a business we're in if we preach the gospel to make a willing people, a people prepared for the Lord, Luke 1, 17. Just as a captain beats his drum in the city to call up a company of volunteers to be armed and ready to take the field at an hour's notice, and follow the prince. The gospel calls men to stand ready for God's service, whatever the cost. So this gospel of peace then brings the good news of peace between God and man, sealed obviously by the blood of Christ. It is this great gift, this rich gift of God to the repenting sinner, who having before had only a fearful looking for of judgment and uh, fiery indignation, uh, now find themselves in a very different place. As soon as they hear peace by the preaching of the gospel, and as soon as that is confirmed in their conscience by the work of the Spirit, a new life appears in them. And it, it's transforming, and that's really what Gurner is wanting to get to here. It is transforming. These men, he says, who were once so shy of any minor threat are now shed, shod rather with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And they are, they are ready to face um, by God's grace what comes against them. Now, this gospel of peace works so mightily that it makes Christians not only ready to Face what comes, but as we saw in our reading, our first reading in Romans 5, we glory in tribulations also, said the apostle. Uh, they, they are more than conquerors, as, as it says elsewhere. And we find that these words of scripture open at least two points of doctrine, and th this is where really we're getting to the meat of what he's talking about tonight. The first point of doctrine is, that it's a saint's duty to be prepared to meet any trial. I'm going to say that again. It's a saint's duty to be prepared to meet any trial. And then secondly, gospel peace prepares the Christian to face the trouble, whatever it might be. So it's a duty of the Christian to be prepared to face any trial. There is a preparation for trials. This section, uh, which uh, we, we come to then, uh, begins with Gurnall more or less underlining again what he's already said. It is our duty as believers to be prepared to endure any hardship and trial which God lays out for us in our Christian walk. And Christians, of course, will never be without these trials. Augustine, he quotes Augustine here, said the bloody sweat which Christ felt signified the sufferings which he would endure in his mystical body. Well, be that as it will, we can be certain of this, that as Christ's whole body was lifted up on the cross, no member of his mystical body, the church, can expect to escape the cross now. Now, that's, that's quite an interesting thought, really, from Colonel there. And when it comes to us... It will not speak glory for the Savior if we merely yield passively to God's will and you know, be, be stoic about it and, uh, um, as the word would say, just bear it. No, we must be ready with an active, holy patience to obey and to be led down into the very chambers of death itself, if, if that is the will of God. He speaks then about an epitaph that he saw on, on a gravestone once. It's, it's quite a striking epitaph. Here lies one against his will. Here lies one against his will. 
Well, he says, that should never be engraved on a Christian's gravestone. Paul had the holy mind of Christ when he confessed, I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of our Lord. Now, the skeptic, of course, will say that the apostle's boldness flourished when the enemy was far away. Not a bit of it. Did it fade into fear when he looked death in the face? Not at all. 2 Timothy 4, there he is at the end of his days with a very, very uncertain future lying ahead of him. I am ready, he says, to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand, but I'm still ready. I'm as ready to face it now as I was when I, when I said something similar some time ago. In fact, if you listen carefully, Gurnall says, you will hear Paul speaking as if, as if his death had already happened. As he was dead before the stroke was given. Not from fear, but from a complete resignation to it. A criminal is dead in the sense of the law as soon as the judge speaks a sentence. The condemned man may, of course, live on death row for some time afterwards. And in the same way, in a gospel sense, we say those are dead who have willingly put themselves under the authority of their father and are ready for death. Paul's serenity of spirit was even more remarkable if we consider how close he stood to his death. Perhaps he knew he would be beheaded, for he alludes to the pouring out of the blood or wine used in sacrifice. You remember he uses that illustration elsewhere. And the sacrifice which he willingly offered up in the service of Christ was like the believers pouring out their drink offering to God. So preparation for trial, all of that really is introductory to this next section, which I want to deal with. And this section is headed, why Christians must be ready for trials. Now, we're not going to complete this section tonight. I'll deal with the first point that Garnell makes. And the first reason he gives for the Christian being ready for trials is that Christ commands that. Full stop, really. Christ commands it. This is implied in everything that God asks his people to do. Put them in mind, says Paul in Titus 3.1, to be ready to do every good work. And the word in that text implies a, a vessel passioned and prepared for the use of its master. Now, nobody likes to wash a cup and then find it dirty again when you go to use it. You reach for a clean vessel for immediate use. And God expects us to keep our hearts pure from the defilement of sin, but with our affections rising to him. The very illustration that he uses in 2 Timothy 2, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared for every good work. So God calls his redeemed ones to prepare not only for service, but also for suffering. And this is why they must be ready for it. And we saw that in Luke 9 and in verse 23 that I drew your attention to in our reading. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. These words, says Gardner, could be called the Christian's contract, sealed by the Spirit of God. For everyone who will be Christ's servant must agree to this relationship before he can call him master. He then proceeds to analyze that verse in Luke 9. And he says four things about it. And I'm just going to deal with four. And that will be us. And he deals quickly with them. First of all, he says, the Christian must deny himself. Now, you see where this is fitting in with everything he said. God says that the believer is re must be ready for trials. Let, if a man will come after me, let him deny himself. Christ asks a saint to take his hands off his own will and give it up to the Lord. From the day that you enter the service of Christ, 
you answer the Savior's call, you must answer the Savior's call with, I will. Self-denial, a spirit of self-denial, a readiness of self-denial, whatever that may lead to. So the Christian must deny himself. The second point that he takes from that particular passage is this. Christ gives his people a cross to take up before he gives them a crown to wear. Luke 9.23 again. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. He intends that not only will the Christian bear it because the worldly man or woman, well, they can do that against their will. But he says, the Lord tells you to take it up, to take it up. It's not just landed on you. You are to take it up. Now, does that mean to say that you're to go looking for trouble? Of course not. We are not to make our own cross and run headlong into difficulty. But he does want us to take up that cross that he has made for us. We should not step out of the way by any deceitful shift, says Gurnall, to escape trouble. We're not to go looking for it, but neither are we to try by some deceitful way to get round it. Um, but to accept the burden that God has chosen as if he were doing us a favor to let us suffer for it. Take it up. Now, Gurnall points out, nobody stops and picks up something that is worthless. You keep going. But Christ asks his people to take up the cross the way another person would take up a pearl that was lying on the ground in front of them. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. But he is to do it daily, and that's a third point that Gurnall makes. He wants a saint to take up his cross daily. Even when there is no burden on the believer's back, he must carry one in his heart, preparing himself continually to answer the first call when it comes. He points out that phrase that Paul uses elsewhere, that I die daily. No. That didn't mean that he died physically daily, obviously, but it meant that he was ready to die. He didn't let his preoccupation with what he had on his hands at that moment make him dread future trials. There was a readiness for it, a heart readiness, that whatever the Lord would bring, he would bring. God instructed the Jews to eat the Passover meal with their loins girded and shoes on their feet and the staff in their hand. You remember Exodus 12, 11. And while the father is feasting, the Christian uh, with comforts, you must have the gospel shoe on. And remember that you're not dining at home, but that you're eating in the way you would in an inn or a tavern, ready to travel as soon as you are refreshed a little for the trip. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Well, these last words are Colonel's last words. The Christian must follow Christ while he bears his cross. God does not want the saint to stand still and fret, or to have to be pushed and coaxed to move, but to follow Christ, and to do so voluntarily, just as a soldier would follow his captain. But Christ, you know, is not like a general who, who, who drives his soldiers into battle, whether they want to go or not. Instead of demanding, he invites. And he gives. And a heart that is full of grace will follow Jesus into the wilderness of affliction. Uh, just as quickly as a lover would go with her beloved into a quiet garden. By his word and by his spirit, he satisfies the believer, making him want to be with him anywhere. I will allure her 
into the wilderness and speak comfortably to her, Hosea 2, 14. So that is the first uh, main point that he's making here. Why Christians must be ready for trial? Because Christ commands it, and he's demonstrated that by that verse in Luke 9. He's then going to tell us that not only does Christ demand it, but Christ deserves it. But that is next time and another passage if we are spared even to see it. <laughs>